can do a bit of reviewing. So anything that we don't take up now, we can, uh, we can get, get later. So what I want to do is just take a uh, <coughs> take a brief view through PC resistivity. And actually, because you've done done the labs, you've actually seen a lot of this stuff. So we can go through it fairly quickly and, uh, yeah, just make sure that you, you, you've got everything. So here's the first point. We put a current into the ground, and then we get currents that go out like that, and we can measure the potential, and we've got an expression for the potential. We can rearrange that and get the, the true resistivity. In fact, I need to have four electrodes, right? So I need two for uh, my currents, two for the potentials. I'm going to call them A and B for the currents, M and N for the potentials. And I can get a same kind of expression, which I can rearrange, and I can get this quantity here to give me the resistivity from any particular uh, voltage measure. When I have a layered earth, however, uh, the currents are going to go in different directions. They're going to be channeled in layers that there's uh, high conductivity or, or low resistivity. And so here you can see what's happening here. We've got a low resistive layer and the currents get channeled through. And the apparent resistivity then will change. It won't be the value of the top. It won't be the value of the bottom. It's going to be something in the middle. For instance, here, with this electrode configuration, parent resistivity is 226. That's greater than 100, and it's less than 500. And you had an app that you that you used uh, in, in the lab, so I think you're familiar with that. The one thing that we didn't explicitly talk about was different uh, geometries. Uh, we talked about soundings. And a sounding was when you take a particular geometry and you just expand it around some central point. So there was two. There's the winner sounding, in which the distances between all the electrodes are A. That's what you used in, in the lab. There's also called a Schlumberger uh, experiment, in which you have the A and the B, uh, but the uh, potential electrodes are kind of a little bit more on the inside. So they're, they're, they're basically kissing cousins, but sometimes you'll hear you know, somebody say, well, I'm going to do a Schlumberger experiment. Somebody's going to do a winner. And all the difference is, is where those potential electrodes are. The idea with a sounding is that if you take either of these configurations, you take a central point and you expand out, then gradually you're seeing deeper and deeper. So this is what we saw when we had everything really close together. The currents are in here, the apparent resistivity is essentially just that of the upper, upper layer, so 100 ohm meters. However, as you go farther, now the currents are slipping into the ground. The apparent resistivity is 135. And we can start to plot this on what we call a sounding curve. And as we go even farther, the apparent resistivity now gets up over, over, over 200. So plotting all those things give a sounding curve. That is just the data. And what we really want to do is to see OK, can we take this data and map it into a true uh, resistivity structure? The one thing that was important to bring out of the lab was that in order to see deep, like if you've got a layer of some thickness <coughs> uh, L, in order to see the bottom of that layer, <laughs> then you actually have to have electrodes that are significantly bigger than that, at least a factor of three or maybe up to five. We didn't, <coughs> excuse me, we didn't talk about inversion, but what, what we want to do is to take our data, which looks like this, that's our sounding curve, and you go invert those to get out a true representation of the resistivity structure as a function of depth. So this is an apparent resistivity structure uh, as a function of you know, some kind of scale length, the length of your, your array. <clears throat> so it tells you something about what's, what's happening, but certainly not the detail that you want. So whenever you go work for a geotechnical company, what they're going to do is to take that sounding curve, 
and they're going to translate that into a resistivity uh, with depth, and usually they're going to have a number of layers. If we have a confined conductor, so suppose that we've got something that looks like this, uh, then you notice that the current lines change. They, they kind of go around the region that's resistive, and they kind of get sucked in through regions that are conductive. You had an app that looked at what happens for uh, confined bodies. So here's an example where we put a cylinder into an earth. We've got an A electrode here and a B electrode here. So the current goes from A to B, uh, but it does so in a way that it's uh, kind of deflected by this cylinder in here. And you can see what happens here. So it's coming in and then it goes chunk, it kind of gets sucked into that conducting sphere and then kind of comes back up. So the current is actually kind of changing directions from what it was in just a, a, a uniform uh, half space. So for a homogeneous earth, we had something that looked like that. For a conductive sphere, we had something that looks like this. And so then the question is, okay, what's happening here? I, why are the field lines changing direction? What's happening that the currents are actually kind of going around or, or getting sucked in? In the lab, we kind of talked about this, but it was a little brief. And that is the, the fact that if current is going to flow through a body, it must do so in such a way that the normal component of that current density is, is, is continuous. So if I'm, you know, this box is sitting here, it's a different conductivity. You know, as it comes in through this interface, whatever current is going in here has got to be coming out here. So that has to be continuous. So that means J, which is the normal, J sub N, is the normal component of the current density. This has to be equal on both sides. But then, J, Ohm's law, says that J is equal to sigma times E. So sigma 1, E1, has to be equal to sigma 2, E2. In this case, the 1 and the 2 refer to, okay, the incident, you know, the, the median that I'm in as 1, and 2 is the median that I'm going into. So in this case here, I've got a medium something something like that here this is medium one this is medium two so j one n is equal to j two n so sigma one e one n is equal to sigma two e two n so that has to be but if sigma one is different than sigma two that means that e one cannot be equal to e two the product is the same but these individual components so that means that E1 is different from E2. And the question is, how the heck does that happen? How can I get an electric field coming in here and actually changing from this side to that side? Well, from first year physics, and I'm sure you did this, you looked at the example where you took a plexiglass plate, okay, and you simply put a charge on that plate. You Remember that? Anybody? Hmm? You must. Did first year physics? <laughs> <laughs> huh? Okay. So, first year physics tells you that if I have a charge, and now because it's a plate, it's a charge density. So it's tau, and that's a charge density, and so it's coulombs per meter squared. So coulombs, that's the size of the charge, right? Per meter squared. Now, if I've got a charge density tau on here, then there's an electric field that emanates out this way that is equal to the electric field is tau over 2 epsilon naught. And the same is this way. So this is also tau over 2 epsilon. But you see they're pointing in opposite directions. So that means that if Samantha's charge, okay, I'm, I'm coming over this way, I'm going to see an electric field from her that's going out this way, 
And over on this side, it's going to be this way. So in one case, if my initial electric field is going like this, it's going to be re reduced. And then over here, it's going to be increased. OK, so that is how we change the electric field. And if I change the electric field, then that allows my currents to, to go around. So this is the fundamental physics of, of what is going on. But it's actually even more important than that because the thing that we're going to measure, remember, we're just measuring potentials. So each, you know, each charge that I have is going to give me some electric potential up, up here. So the end result, the existence of this conductor is totally, 100%, absolutely defined by all the charges that, that are built up in here. And these charges, we often refer to them as the secondary charge. So remember, you had a toggle button. Uh, there's total charges that you have. The total charge is everything. Okay. So remember, if you hook a battery up, that's like some big cube here. And here's a negative cube. Okay. And now in this case, so if we have a homogeneous half space, that's all we got. If we have a cylinder in here, okay, then we're going to get this negative charge in here and a positive charge in, in here. And then we're going to measure you know, whatever potential we have that's associated with these charges and, and these charges here. Okay, so the total charge is everything, and the secondary charge is just whatever is, is happening. So you can plot those up. So the only thing that you kind of need to know, it's on the next page, is this formula here. Because the thing that you're often interested in is like, okay, what, what, what sign is the charge going to be? Is that positive or, 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 or negative? So just because the current is coming like this doesn't necessarily tell you what the charge is going to, to, to be here. Uh, that charge is distinguished by whether or not you're going from a resistor to a conductor or conductor to resistor. So in this case here, these rows up here, again, are medium one, medium two. So in the case where you had a 10 ohm meter uh, cylinder and this was 500 ohm meters, okay, you're coming in this way. So now row one is equal to 500, row two is equal to 10. And so if I look at row two minus row one, I get minus 490 is equal to tau. So I'm going to, I'm going to have a negative value if it goes from a resistor to a conductor. Conversely, if I go from inside the cylinder to the outside, I go from 10 to 100. So now row one is 10, row two is 500. So it's going to be. Positive. So this is two important things. One is I've got a, if I've got a current that's coming into something that's changing its conductivity, I'm going to build up a charge. And the other is, okay, what sign is it? It's given by that. So this is what you saw. Everybody has, has now worked with that. So we've got total currents going in here. This, this is a, uh, a, a conductor. It gives us a negative charge here, positive charge here. And here's what the charges are going to look like. And here's those secondary potentials. Yeah, Marna? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Do the discontinuous lines, like the lines in the background, they don't go like from the source to the receiver, but it's like line segments. In here? Uh, sorry, which one do you refer to? Any of the line segments in the top left diagram that arch all the way from one to the other, there's like small line segments. Do they mean anything? Oh, yeah, no, no, yeah, that's just plotting. Yeah, the other lines, the lines are all continuous, but uh, yeah, just the plotting tool doesn't make them all. Yeah, no, there's no, no stopping to go. So the, so the idea here was that if you had a current that coming in, you've got a, uh, a, 
a cylinder, if you've got a conductive sphere, you're going to have negatives and positives. And if you've got a resistive sphere, you're going to have positives and negatives. Okay? Yeah, so they, just to remind you again, the total potential, okay, is the sum of all the charges, including these guys here, and the secondary potential is just due to these guys here. So the total potential for that uh, cylinder looks you know, positive here, negative up here, but if you just look at the secondary potential, you just see those potentials due to the charges on, on the cylinder. Okay, so how does that work? Now, suppose that we have this system here. So let's just look at, let's fix A and B. So we've got the currents fixed. And now we're going to look at various places on here. So here's the screw. So I got something that looks like this. I got my A electrode here and my B electrode here. Right, so if I get something, here's, here's what my charges are gonna be, right? So that's that sort of sets up the experiment. Now you wanna come and do a measurement. Okay, so I'm gonna do a measurement over here, right? And so I'll calculate a delta B and then I'll calculate an apparent resistivity, which is delta V over, I can never do I to refer the key. Okay. Um, so I calculate my apparent resistivity, and I'm going to get some, some, some number. And when I do that, so the background is 500 ohm meters. When, when I'm sitting, well, in this case, I'm sitting right over top, so I'm going to put this guy here, and, and what do I see? I see an apparent resistivity of 430 ohm meters. So that's less than 500, right? So, and I've got a conductive sphere, a row resistivity sphere, so that's, that, that, that's kind of good. And if I go way out to the side, I'm kind of removed from that, I basically see 500 ohm meters. So as I'm Moving along from here across here, my apparent resistivities are going to change from the background 500 to something that's a little bit lower. In this case, 430, and then back up to 500. So I'm not getting down like at Soggy's, the 10 ohm meter guy I'm looking for. I'm not getting down to 10 ohm meters because I'm kind of diluted by the rest of that base. But I'm, yeah, it's low. So I'm seeing a bit of, uh, of, of an edge. So what that uh, does is start to give us an idea about okay how could we how could we set all of this up so that if I'm let's suppose I'm I'm looking for Samantha at, at this point okay so now you're a conductor or resistor and I'm going to try to find you right so I'm going to start off with an array that I'm just going to kind of move over over top, and I'm going to start off with an array that looks like this. So it's going to be an A and a B that are short, and an M and an N that are also short, and everything is going to be together. So this is like a it's like a dipole dipole, right? And I'm just going to kind of move over. Now remember the depth of penetration that I get is such that my array has to be bigger than my depth of the body. So if I'm going to try to see Samantha, I need an array that's like this size, and then I can just go along and I could keep going, I could find Alan, I could find Sage, I could, like I can see this whole first row, right? That's because my Kind of depth of penetration is sort of tuned to this particular geometry. But I cannot see Josh. I just don't go down that far. So what am I going to do to see you? 
Well, I could do that. <laughs> I'm now thinking like, okay, this is the ground. Like, that's hard. I gotta go wider, right? Okay, so now I go wider, and now I can see down to that you know, second row. If I keep going wider, then get Arno, and then eventually the back. When I come along with a fixed geometry like this, that's called profiling. Okay, I take a single geometry, and I'm just moving along. So I'm just collecting a profile. And so what I'm going to see is dependent upon what the size of that array is. If I change it, make the array longer, I could also do a profiling, but now I'm kind of seeing a bit different. Okay, that's it. So here's, let's suppose I'm trying to find this sphere. If I start off with something that looks like this, and I come along and I do a profile along here, then I just see 500 meters. I just see this stuff up at the top. But if I make this array bigger, and I move it along, now look what I get. I get something that's basically 500 ohm meters at the end, but in the middle, it's like 300 ohm meters. So horizontally, I kind of got this guy nailed. It's going to, it's, there's going to be something right under, underneath here, and maybe there's enough other information that I could actually tell you how to do it. So that's the ticket, yeah. Uh, why does the graph go above the 500 ohm meters before it be down? Good question. Would you give him a star? <laughs> nice, nice. I actually spend 15 minutes uh, when I teach this course talking about that. Uh, I'm going to come back to that because it does take a couple of minutes, but that is a good question. <laughs> it goes above this. You wouldn't think it should, right? So we're going to count. Anyway, I don't have enough time. So we want to do, we kind of want to expand. So if we expand, we're doing sounding. If we move laterally, we're doing a profile. And really, if, like if I don't know anything about what's going on here, I probably want to do both. So here's exactly how we're going to do it. And I'm going to introduce, first of all, array types. So we talked about Wenner and Schlumberger. We often use those for soundings. And then everything else somehow makes a variant of the four electrodes. We can't get around not having four electrodes. So if I have electrodes, So here's my four electrode system. Just generically, doesn't matter how I put them up. So here's an A, here's a B, here's an M, and here's an M. Okay? Two parts, two potentials. When we use this, we often refer to it as a dipole dipole. Okay? That's the current dipole, it's potential dipole dipole. The other thing that we could do. <coughs> do this, is we say, oh, suppose I took this B electrode here, and I just ran it way in heck and gone out here. So this B electrode is still a need for the circuit, but it's so far away, I don't really, it doesn't really play a big role. And in that case, I just got a current pole, so this is like a pole, and this is like so we often refer to this system as a pole dipole system. Conversely, I can do the same with this. I can run this guy out and put the N electrode out here, in which case I now have a current and a potential, and they're both kind of like poles. So now it's called a pole pole experiment. In the app, you have all of these things for doing dipole, dipole, pole, pole, uh, pole, dipole. Uh, you, you could do all of those things, and that is just referring to these configurations. And if you think this is actually not used in practice, if you go to the mineral industry and they're looking for something that's deep, suppose you've got a corporate deposit in Chile, 
they will run wires out two or three kilometers. And uh, yeah, put that other electrode over there and then get a pole dipole uh, experiment. Okay, so that's the configurations. And now, here we come to the plotting, which again I tried to, yeah. Are there ever more than four electrodes in a survey like this? No, every time you, well, every time you take a number, you're activating two electrodes as currents and two as potentials. In fact, when you actually go out and collect data, and for any geotechnical company, like if you go work for gold or something like that, uh, what they're going to do is lay out an array of electrodes that's maybe, uh, very often it's like 120. So you have 120 electrodes, you just lay them out. And then you have a, you know, a little box that you can activate. So this is one, two, three, four, five, 120. You can activate five as an A electrode, and then this one here as a B electrode, and this as an M electrode, and this as an N electrode. You can program anything. So you just, you actually do all the hard work first. You lay out, you lay out all of the electrodes, and then you just program like, okay, I want that. I want this guy at some point to be current. Uh, later on, I'm going to make use of this potential. That's kind of what we're we're, we're sort of uh, doing up up here. So what I'm going to show you now is that pseudo section, how you plot that guy. Uh, so here's a here's a dipole dipole. Okay, and remember, in the lab, I said, well, how are you going to plot this guy? And the answer was that I'm going to just choose, this is, this is a choice, so here's my current dipole, here's my potential dipole, and so I'm going to get some number, so here's some delta B, and so I'm going to get an apparent resistivity, so I can plot it. So, I'm going to make a 45 degree angle here, 45 degree angle here, and then I'm going to plot that guy smack in the middle. So whatever apparent resistivity I had, and maybe it's 47 on meters, I can put 47. Now if I move this thing along, so if I, if I keep this fixed and move this, or move the whole array along, I'm going to get a different position here. So imagine I have this guy here come out over here. So now I have to be. So where am I going to plot this? Well, you're using the same method. You do a 45 degree line, you plot it here. So this, this depth on here, it's called a pseudo depth. It's, it's just some, the, the idea is that, okay, somehow we're looking deeper, right? So the idea that our electrodes are farther apart, then you know, we must be looking deeper. So it kind of makes some sense to plot numbers in this way so that when the size of the array is large, I'm plotting deeper. When the size of the array is small, I'm plotting up here. So you see, that's, that's like a really sensible way of, uh, of plotting things. So as we, as we look here, so I got to see what happens when I move this guy. So now it's plotting there, plotting there. Oops. So what you're going to see here, this is now generally how the data are are, are, are taken. It's supposed to be a pole dipole, or sorry, dipole dipole, and then we're going to fix this guy here, and then just move this one progressively outward, and then we're going to move everything over and continue to do the same. So as we move it out, then we're expecting things to plot along a line like this, and then as we shift things over, we're going to be plotting this, dot, dot, dot. So let's see how that works. So you can see how it, see how we're building how we're building things up, we're gradually moving the whole array to the right, but each time we move the current electrode, then you know, we expand those potentials and we, we, we measure them, and gradually we're starting to build up this uh, plot here. 
So now we're just write all those numbers. And then we can contour. Okay, now you got a picture. You might think it's starting to look like geology. Okay, so what have we got here? First of all, it's an apparent resistivity. So just those numbers that we've got before. This is true horizontal distance on here. This is some kind of, of depth. If we look at the scale, the blue is resistive and the red is conductive or low resistive. So if you look here, like, ah, that's interesting. Looks like there's something happening there. Maybe it's a low, maybe that's our cylinder that we're looking for. Maybe there's something out here. So let's just take a look at what those things are. And by the way, we call them pseudo sections, right? So we call this thing here when we got a pseudo section. It's not a real thing, it's just a way of plotting the data. But sometimes, like look at this, you could actually get out some geologic information. So here's a here's a prism, and we're going to go ahead and we're going to do that resistivity experiment over, over top. And when I do that, I get out a pseudo section that looks like this. So that's kind of cool. Right? So I, I, I don't have an image of the block, but you know, there's something clearly that's happening in this region. It looks like there's some pant lakes. Yeah, but with a little bit of you know modeling and expertise, yeah, you might think like, oh, maybe I could drill down in here and I might get something. Yep. So it only shows you the horizontal location of the object, but it doesn't show you the depth. That's why you call it. That's right. We do, at this point we don't really know what that depth is. We could kind of make a conversion, say like, okay, this is n spacing four, so what's the length? And, you know, divide that by three. Probably. Okay, so that's that's a pseudo section, and there for many many years there were people around called geophysicists that claimed that they could look at this and uh, understand what the geology was. Sometimes they get more, sometimes not. So let me show you what happened. So suppose I take this the same little thing we got here, and I I alter it. I'm just going to put a little bit of background junk in there. You know, maybe little bits of graphite, or clays, or, or, or whatever. And it's actually going to look like this. Here's my pseudo section. The point about this is if I've got like little bits of you know, conductive stuff up close to the surface, it can completely swamp my signal. Right? So now my pseudo section looks like that. That is not geology. You know, yeah. Um, no, you're not sacrificing anything. In fact, you generally want to get stuff that's really quite, quite reasonable. Yeah, there's, uh, there's going to be higher dynamic range in the data that's close to the electrodes, but both of those data are actually important. It's just that when you plot the data out to the pseudo section, you get something that just doesn't make much sense. And here's another one. So here's an example where you've got a bit of topography, so that's what this is, and there's kind of a resistive overburden, a little bit more of a conductive overburden, and then there's two uh, conductivity blocks that are kind of smoothed off. One's over here, and one's over here. So that's what you're looking for. You'd like to find those two guys. So you go ahead and you do a DC resistivity experiment and you plot up your pseudo section and look what you get. You got this great big red spot. So that looks good, right? People love to drill red spots. But if you were sitting here and you drilled down through there, okay, then that would mean you're actually drilling right down through the center. Totally missed it. The point about this is that this is actually really important data, but you do not want to make a geologic interpretation just by looking at this data. So 
few questions, we'll move on. So what we really want to do is that next step, which is to invert the data. So that means that we're going to take our data, we're going to throw it in through this processing technique, which I hope I get a bit of a chance to talk to you about. But anyway, that is at least going to give us out a resistivity model that is kind of calibrated to horizontal distance and depth. So that's what we want to do. And virtually any resistivity uh, data sets that you get from any geotechnical company or in there, they will have gone through this inversion process. So here's what happens. So if we do that buried prism, okay, so this is what we have. Here is the pseudo section. If we now, excuse me, take and invert those data, we actually get a resistivity structure that looks like this. So that's pretty nice. So this is the this is true depth in meters, horizontal location, and if we look to see what this is, it is actually centered completely right above that true body. We don't have the you know, sharp sides or anything like that. Uh, part of that's the nature of the inversion algorithm because we're asking for simplicity and smoothness and stuff like that. So you can see how this is kind of smoothed off. These contours are contours of resistivity. Uh, but that is now a very, very nice representation of this. And the forward model data, so if we take this, predict what the data are, we get something that looks like that. So we actually do pretty, pretty well. Let's go to this harder example. Remember this guy? So here was our resistivity. All that's got all this junk. Here's the pseudo section. Can't see anything. However, if you invert those data, you end up with something like this. So the cool part about this is that, first of all, not only do you find this target, okay, but you actually are finding you know, these other conductors up here. So maybe they're just geologic noise, but maybe there's some information in them. Whatever. This has signal both about what's happening near surface and what's happening down. So maybe that kind of helps answer, answer your question. You want to have kind of near offsets to kind of delineate what the surface stuff is and far offsets. And if we do this example here where we have our uh, more complicated model with, with topography, here is our uh, section. we go ahead and we invert these data, we end up with something that looks like this. So now we've actually got a pretty, you know, we've got a good sense. There's a conductor here and there's one over here. Don't have all the details. We don't have enough depth of investigation to really see this bottom part. You know, and things are, you know, a little bit smoother, but you know, you, you, you got a good idea of like, okay, if I drill here or if I drill here, there's likely a conductor. So the, uh, that kind of takes you through some of the important points, just to reassess uh, the concept of profiling and sounding, putting that together, getting out a, uh, a pseudo section for data, inverting those data to get a, uh, a, a resistivity search. So the world is 3D. Uh, that can make some of the problems really, you know, much more complicated because you've got to worry about, you know, the target, the shape, the size. So, first of all, so let's talk about the world. I'm sorry, we're talking about the world. So, how many people got their name tags? You know what's going to happen, don't you? <laughs> Everybody can share. Okay. So the way this works. And I must admit, my, my wife was so totally against this, but I am adamant, right? So she said, it's Halloween, you've got to give everybody one. And I said, nope. <laughs> <laughs> so this is how it works. If you have a sign, you get to take a star, and you get to take a candle. And that means it passes by 
Whoa. There's a lot of signs coming. It passes by everybody else. However, not all is lost because I am just saying there's going to be some left over. So for those people who didn't get tested today, bring your thing in on Friday. There might be something. Although I don't trust Soggy. Soggy, <laughs> especially O. Henry Bars. He's, he's like kind of, you know, so again, Okay, so while that is going along, okay, so we're. Well, that's actually a lot of signs coming up. Wow. Okay, so that's a bit disruptive, but we're gonna. We got ten minutes. We need to. Uh, I want to show you a case history. So the, the world is 3D, right? So that means there's questions about you know, where to put currents and where to measure potentials. And there's just like there's a ton of complicating issues, issues here uh, about how to how to do things. And uh, yeah, the the important thing is is sensitivity. I'm only going to say one thing, I wouldn't ask the questions if we had more time. But sensitivity, if somebody's ever talking about sensitivity, then they're talking about how much signal there's going to be from that particular object. So suppose, suppose it's Stephanie that I, I try, try to get a thing putting up. Uh, then, the, and then the question is, okay, is my survey, is it going to be sensitive to the existence of Stephanie? So that means, first of all, my source, if, the, if, there, if that's going to work, my source has to excite her, right? So I have to be driving currents down into you, right, so that there's enough charges that are built up. That's the first part. The second part is my receiver, I have to be close enough. Remember, it's a potential electrode, so I need to be close to my charges in order to see something. So it's a combination of exciting and measuring. And so sensitivity is going to tell me how much a, my data is going to be affected by the existence or not of a particular object. Uh, yeah. I'm just going to give you the case history. So this is an example that uh, was done a number of years ago, we're going to see this example again when we do induced polarization. But I'm going to show it in this sort of seven-step uh, uh, framework, and we're going to use DC resistivity to see what we get. So first of all, here's the setup. It's a mineral deposit. Uh, there's volcanic units up here. Uh, there's siltstones, and there's mineralized zones here. There's a particular uh, region that uh, has got a mineralization that's associated with it, and that is, is what we want to find. And the question is, can we find a, uh, a, a conductive unit, okay, within a whole bunch of siltstones and volcanics, uh, can we find that, and can it be identified with the DC resistivity? So first of all, of course, we need to know what the resistivities are, right, because we we cannot distinguish something unless that something has got a very different resistivity than the, than the neighbor. So if I'm going to distinguish Karina from Stephanie, they better be different values, right? Otherwise, there's no hope. So when we look at this, and now I'm going to go to conductivity because the numbers are so big, that there's some numbers here that are low. Uh, there's volcanics that have a very low uh, conductivity. The thing that we're looking for uh, is something called a Mount Noble Horizon. That's that's conductive. Uh, there's some siltstones in there that have got kind of moderate conductivity. And there's also another unit, it's called a breakaway shale or black shale, that's got a, a very high conductivity. So anyway, those are our rock units. We're going to see what we can do with them. So we're going to do an experiment. Uh, this is going to be a pole dipole experiment. I talk about that. So basically, what you do is you set out a whole bunch of electrodes on the surface. 
and then you use this guy as a current, and then you just measure the electric potentials everywhere else, and then you uh, plot this, the, the pseudo section. And you gradually move that current electrode over this way, and you end up something like that. So here's the region. Uh, so just for, for scale, uh, this region in here is about four kilometers from here to here. More or less, the, the geologic structure is kind of north-south. Uh, and what they're going to do is to do uh, about 10 lines of data east-west uh, across there. And when they do that, each of these is a pseudo section that's obtained. Okay, so just to kind of clarify, so we've got a region in here, and we take one line, okay? So we do this pole dipole experiment, and we end up with a pseudo section. For, for here. We've got another line here, another one here, another one here, and you got 10 lines of data. Okay, here's what they are. So these are 10 lines of data. They're all a little bit different. Some of them are red. Okay, so you get red stuff in here. That means that there's something in there that has got a high conductivity. So something's happening. Uh, but really, that's your data. So you've got one 3D geologic model, and you don't see that in here. So remember I talked about exciting the, 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 the object. So this is a pole-dipole experiment. But we could reverse that. So instead of having the currents on this side, we could put the currents on the other side. And when we do that, we're actually going to have like the leading thing is a dipole and a pole. So we call that pole-dipole. Now there's a couple things that you, you might notice here. First of all, that these pictures are different. These pseudo sections are different than what they were back here. But I still have another 10 pseudo sections. So where am I in all of this? I have 20 maps of data. 20 maps of data. None of them is geologically interpretable. But what I want to do is to take those 20 maps of data and somehow invert them to get one three-dimensional geologic model. So that's what we're going to do. So how we're going to do this is as follows. We're going to take a mathematical cube, okay, x, y, and z, okay, and we're going to divide it up into a whole bunch of cells, and each of those cells has got a, a constant value of conductivity but unknown. Okay. So now in the inverse problem, what we're going to do is adjust the values of these cells so that, first of all, I fit those 20 maps of data, and at the same time, I find something that's hopefully geologically reasonable. So I'm going to try to go for something that's a little bit of a minimum structure and uh, fits all the data. So what you're going to now see is the result of that. So here there is, uh, I think in this one there was like a, a, a around a million cells. So that's, that's actually a lot of numbers to try to find, right? So now we've got a million parameters to try to estimate. So it's a big computation problem. And then the end result is this cube of, of numbers. So I've got a million cells and each one of them has got a particular conductivity. And now I'm going to plot that. And I'm going to do that in a couple of ways. Uh, this is this is the 3D model that we that we have from the inversion, and the red is going to be conductive, and the blue is resistive. So even at this point here, you can see the, this is really blue in here. Those are volcanics that, that, that are here, and you know there's something that's, that's red in here. So we're we're going to try to look for something that is. Um, so I'm going to slice, so first of all, I can tell you what I'm going to I'm going to take this cube and I'm going to slice it in and back. So now we're going to be looking at cross sections, but into the board and back out. And then we're going to look at plan view. Yeah. And then we're going to also spin this whole thing around with different volume rendering uh, limits so that we progressively end up with only the most conductive part. So 
So your eye is definitely catching this red thing on the right, but there's a little red guy. More in the center. Now we're going to go down in plan view. So you can see the great big red guy. Now he's turning around. So we're progressively increasing the limit of the isosurface so that by the end of this movie, you only see that. Okay, so first of all, how cool is that, right? So we've taken 20 sections of data, none of which are have any particular information in themselves. We've combined all of those with the appropriate equations, done an inversion, and we end up with something now that, that looks like this. So geologically, first of all, what the heck is this thing? That turns out to be that black shale unit. Remember I said there was something that was really, uh, was really conductive? So that's what this guy is. So first of all, geologically, we've got a 3D structure. It's, it's that black, uh, black shale. Unfortunately, that is not a thing that's economically interesting. Okay? Um, but there is a little dab of something here, which actually turns out to be a hint of that Mount Novot uh, horizon that, that we're looking for. And we're going to revisit this because we're going to do right at the very last, we're going to do something called induced polarization. And while we're doing the DC, we're also calculating the IP response. And I'm going to show you how to take that IP response and calculate a three-dimensional charge of ability. And you will see that out of that comes the understanding of this, where that particular deposit is. So I trust your honor system, OK? Maybe. And if there's any left, I'll bring some in on Friday. Okay.